<laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's good to see you here. And he hello, everyone who is online. And I understood that some of uh, you are east part of uh, Canada and you have late evening. Anyway, welcome to this public lecture that is organized by this uh, Summit Pacific College School of Graduate Studies. And uh, I am Riku Tukkurainen, uh, Dean of Graduate Studies. So tonight uh, we are going to have a few things here. First, we are going to hear the lecture from uh, Dr. Aaron Ross, uh, titled Past, Present and Future, Reconciliation as an Everyday Reality. What a um, uh, very uh, contemporary topic and very, very important topic to us uh, these days and times. So uh, um, I would like to say a few words about Aaron. Uh, he has recently come here to BC uh, around a little bit over half a year ago, and he is a senior or lead pastor at Richmond Pentecostal Church. And uh, with a small and growing family. Yeah. Okay, you can say more about that if you if you like. Uh, and uh, his uh, PhD work uh, from uh, the University of Toronto is from uh, pastoral and homiletics and that type of things. But also his PhD thesis was exactly about this from this area that we are going to hear from uh, tonight. Uh, we are supposed to also have a reflection from uh, Reverend Bruce Brown, indigenous pastor and leader here in the BC, and uh, we hope that he is going to make his way here on time when his turn comes. So uh, that's the plan. And then after these presentations, we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. But uh, to honor your, your busy time and uh, in order to get a little bit heat still aboard tonight, uh, we are planning to end this by uh, 8.30. So please uh, welcome Aaron and as he comes and present his paper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sincerely appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to be able to speak to you this evening. Thanks for those that are present uh, on site with us here and also I want to thank those that are tuning in that are joining us via live stream via zoom great to have you here with us and uh, thank you for that those warm words of introduction and welcome Riku it's a, an honor and a privilege to be here and uh, wish to extend greetings to all of those who have joined us uh, it's an honor to be invited to speak to you. And as I do so, I wish to first of all acknowledge that I speak to you today from Summit Pacific College, pardon me, in the municipality that is today known as Abbotsford, but which stands on the historic, traditional, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish, Stolo, and Kwantlen peoples. I furthermore, acknowledge that I live and work in the city today known as Richmond, BC which stands upon the historic, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Coast Salish, Tawasin, Stolo, and Kwantlen peoples. As I speak to you this evening and, and share this lecture on this subject of reconciliation and the priority of reconciliation, it's very important for me to identify my own position. So identify as I identify as a settler Canadian and today speak to you as a, as a settler Canadian but as I do so, I speak as one who wishes not simply to speak, but more so to listen. I look forward to Reverend Brown in his reflections and what he has to share with us toward the conclusion of our time together this evening. And Reverend Brown, uh, just this past week, a video was distributed to the churches of the British Columbia and Yukon District. And Reverend Brown, graciously shared his testimony and his reflection, uh, his experience himself as a residential school survivor, which I have no doubt we'll hear a little bit about this evening. And just yesterday, our church, Richmond Pentecostal Church, recognized Reconciliation Day as designated by our district. We are honored to listen to Reverend Brown's powerful and moving words of testimony 
encouraging and challenging us to move forward together. I've been looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to coming to be with you all here in Abbotsford. I didn't anticipate that as I arrived, it would be 42 degrees Celsius when I stepped out of the vehicle. I think I left a good trail of melted rubber all the way between uh, Richmond and here on the highway. Uh, but uh, grateful for air conditioning. Uh, grateful for Rob, who's going to be managing our media this evening. And Rob has warned me that at some point this evening, he may switch off the air conditioner. Uh, just because the, the ventilation might interfere during the Q&A period. So roughly around that time, I'll probably dispense of my jacket as well. As full disclosure, I thought I'd share that with you. Anytime we speak on a subject of reconciliation and anytime we speak on the subject of Indigenous peoples, it's very, very important that we emphasize we're not speaking about a people group that is simply to be studied and discussed, least of all, by someone who is non-Indigenous. When we speak about these things, we do so because we want to exist in relationship and partnership with Indigenous people in this country. And it's always important that in that partnership, that we listen to the voices that come from an Indigenous perspective and share with us what, again, as I identify as a separate Canadian, what I specifically need to hear. I do think it's important that we as, and if I can speak for non-Indigenous Canadians, I think it is important for we as non-Indigenous Canadians to prioritize reconciliation. If as we look at the history of this country, the country of Canada, the injustices that have been committed historically and indeed the injustices which in many cases persist into the present, it is not, it should not and must not be the responsibility of Indigenous people, those who have endured those injustices, to carry the lion's share of the burden of reconciliation, but rather should be a priority that's taken on by non-Indigenous people as we work toward decolonization and, if we really mean it, reconciliation. One of the voices that I listen to so frequently is that of my friend Dan Collado, who is Mohawk from Tyndanag, Ontario. And again, as I make a priority of pursuing reconciliation, I furthermore believe that any such conversation must be had in close partnership with representatives of the Indigenous community. Dan is the director of Aboriginal Bible Academy in Deseronto, Ontario. He is the chair of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada Indigenous Ministries Guiding Group. And he has a word for us about this concept of reconciliation over the span of time, both in uh, consideration of past, present, and future. Let's listen to Dan now. Sego, Skunagoa. I greet you today in the Mohawk language. How is your spirit? I'm speaking to you all from the traditional lands of the Iroquois, specifically the Bay of Quinte Mohawk in Tyndanega, which is located about two hours east of Toronto, Ontario. Uh, it's also the birthplace of Taganawida, the peacemaker who brought the original five nations of the Iroquois Confederacy under a constitution of peace dating way back into the 12th century. Uh, I'm Mohawk myself. My grandmother was born and raised in Tyndanega, and I've been involved with Indigenous ministry context uh, for over 25 years now. Uh, I regret not being able to be with you in person or at least live through Zoom, but I counted it a privilege truly to address you all today via this pre-recorded video. Uh, it warms my heart knowing that people of your caliber are entering into this conversation. I think my friend Aaron has really done well in framing his lecture with you around the potentially nebulous concept of time, you know, be it past, present, and future. Uh, I say nebulous because of how people and nations can tend to think and address time, um, and, and it's not uniform across all cultures, and we can often be left a bit confused when we don't understand and appreciate the differences that can exist in some, uh, you know, in, in other cultures concerning this topic of time. We probably don't truly appreciate just how our own concept of time influences our understanding and interaction with others. For instance, um, I can understand how the recent revelations that came out of Kamloops uh, was shocking um, and how, you know, that's been a, a present sort of uh, piece of feeling 
uh, upon uh, each one of us um, and how it has really kind of inspired an increased interest in having these types of conversations. But for many of us within the Indigenous context, uh, the revelation uh, from, from Kamloops really was less shocking and more really of a somber reminder of the systemic injustice that was placed upon many of uh, the over 150,000 children who were subjected to the residential school system. But at least uh, what has been revealed in Kamloops has helped kind of catch people up as it were and has caused many to ask in some measure just how do we respond and what do we do now? Uh, we're all well familiar with the words apology and forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, but I think we'd all agree that any sincere apology must truly be accompanied by like present day actions where the pursuit of forgiveness, reconciliation, and even just the, the pursuit of plain old regular relationship, it, it must be tangibly demonstrated where the desire to change is seen and, and not just heard. I don't think any of us would feel that that's an unreasonable expectation. Uh, after all, Jesus said that um, they, meaning the world, um, that they would know you are my disciples if you love one another. And we all know how tiresome it is to continually be expected to forgive some offense uh, some offensive action that, that just continues to happen. Um, it can be frustrating. And truth is, I, I don't know how God puts up with us because, I mean, we do that to him all the time. At least I know I do. So here we are, we find ourselves in Canada and, and we've been caught up really kind of in this cyclical pattern and experience of apology, forgiveness, apology and forgiveness. And I know that for some Canadians, there, there is this sense of, why are we still on this? You know, didn't we deal with this already? Didn't the government already apologize? You know, didn't our, our own fellowship already apologize? Um, why is this still an issue? Um, well, well, here's the thing. Uh, I think it comes down to just how differing worldviews understand time. Because generally speaking, Indigenous people fee, uh, well, they view time differently than, say, Euro-Canadians do. And let me just kind of look at that for a moment. You see, Western culture thinks of time in a very linear way, right? There's a definite progression of time. You've got a beginning, middle, end. And it's very clearly defined and bordered in terms of like past, present, and future. Whereas the indigenous concept of time, uh, I like to describe it more as being cyclical, where you've got this past, present, uh, and, and future. They're kind of less siloed from one another and more interconnected. And they're always at play in the now because they're is seeing this continual cycle of beginnings and endings always at work. Um, if you think of it like the seasons in nature, um, yes, you've got your progressions. There's spring, there's summer, there's fall, there's winter, but they also repeat. And so an elder might tell a story that happened in the past, whether it's near past or long past is really inconsequential because um, Instead of pinpointing a date like April 12th, 1990, that uh, elder might say, well, it's when the tulips blossom. Um, everyone would know listening to that story that it happened in the spring. And the emphasis is less upon the date of when, but that the experience actually happened. And because of that slight um, slightly different emphasis, it becomes more closely associated with the now rather than a date. And I, I kind of hope that you're following that train of thought there. Um, see, the fact is there is no ancient history uh, for Indigenous people, just, just accounts of, of 
things that have happened previously in the past. And, and for indigenous people, that past never strays very far away from the present, from the now. And why is that? Um, well, I, I need you to consider uh, just how indigenous mindset, how the indigenous mindset would have developed. Uh, indigenous people have lived for eons, seeing themselves as part of the environment, not above it. And so they, they saw themselves, and they see themselves as caretakers, not owners. And so there was a strong connection and very much a strong interdependence upon the environment uh, that, that developed. And so where nature was not seen as, you know, some commodity that could be arbitrarily owned and manipulated, but that humanity was instead subject to the environment. And so you think about it. If you were to grow up in a culture where your ancestry for eons had lived being, you know, greatly influenced by nature, being, being influenced by its physical geography, the movement of wildlife, the changing seasons, you know, things that are nigh on impossible to manipulate. And although they change, they have their cycles. And so at the same time, they remain constant. Spring will come again, right? The geese will return. Uh, and because of centuries of this pattern being, uh, being reinforced, it's just natural to then develop a concept of time itself that reflects this perception that it too cannot be manipulated. And so there really is no difference between, say, now and tomorrow. Um, so you ask a person, when are you going to go fishing? And they would say, well, when the fish are biting. When do you go hunting? When the moose are near. Um, you see, this time, this concept of when you do things, uh, it becomes very heavily subject to the environment for the indigenous person. Um, so let me just kind of draw my thoughts to a close here. For Indigenous people, both the past and the future operate very much in the now. And this understanding, it plays a significant role in developing relationship and reconciliation. And I think it's interesting that this is actually a very biblical concept, this blending of past, present, and future. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 tells us, it says, for by one sacrifice, he is made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Um, if we want to move forward, if we want to break the cycle of apology and forgiveness, apology and forgiveness, um, where, you know, nothing but kind of frustration and angst kind of grows, we, we must bring our past and our futures into today together. Uh, as followers of Christ, we're commissioned to live holy lives today. That's based on the righteousness of Christ that was made available to us in the past so that we might then spend eternity with him in the future. Uh, reconciliation and our, our relationships with others really operates in the same way. I'm friends with Aaron today, your, your lecturer, uh, not simply because of our early interactions a number of years ago, but, but because of what continues to happen between the two of us today and an expectation for the future. When Paul told the Ephesians, right, not to be drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit, he, he used a, a present participle uh, for, uh, for you Greek scholars. Um, it's not just be filled with the Spirit, right? But it's keep on being filled. Yes, by one sacrifice in the past, we've been made perfect forever in the future. But we are also being made holy here in the present. So yes, reconciliation, it begins with the giving and the receiving of forgiveness for the past, but it only really truly continues through intentional engagement of relationship, both today and into the future. 
And so I invite you to journey with the Indigenous people today in reconciliation. Learn of the past and learn from the past while looking to the future. Reconciliation really is an everyday reality, present, past, as well as the future. Niawin, thank you. Thank you, Dan. So appreciate his wise words. I was talking about the Tragically Hip and its frontman, Gord Downey. I never listened to the Tragically Hip, the music fans out there. You may believe I've missed out on, on an awful lot. Maybe I have. Uh, but in the final months of his life, as Gord Downey battled and ultimately succumbed to terminal brain cancer, he left a strong impression on me. Rather than using his final months to enjoy the fruits of his labor of his successful music career, Downey spent his final days drawing the public's attention to the crimes committed against the Indigenous people of Canada through the residential school system. He famously toured and highlighted the tragic story of Chani Wenjack. Wenjack grew up at Ogoki Post on the Martin Falls First Nation. Ogoki Post did not have a day school. And thus, at age nine, when Jack and his three sisters were sent off to Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School near Kenora, Ontario, more than 600 kilometers away. There he was given the anglicized name Charlie. And in October of 1966, when Jack and two of his friends escaped from the Cecilia Jeffrey School during their afternoon time on the playground. They were wearing only light cotton clothes when they ran away. This was when Jack's first and last attempt at escape, when Jack told his friends that he wanted to see his father. In his escape, when Jack followed his two friends to the cabin of their uncle, Charles Kelly, near Reddit, Ontario. And on the first day of their escape, they walked for over eight hours before stopping at a friendly home for the night. After they arrived at the cabin, Kelly took his nephews to his trap line. And when Jack walked the nearly five kilometers to meet them, then set out alone to find his father. Kelly advised Wenjack to follow the railroad tracks to ask railway workers for food. Wenjack carried with him only a glass jar with a few matches. Wenjack survived for the next 36 hours. Weather turned harsh with snow squalls and freezing rain. The temperature went down between minus one and minus seven degrees. With only a cotton windbreaker and no food, Wenjack covered 19 kilometers on foot. <laughs> when Jack died in the early morning of October, 23rd of October, 1966, one week after he had escaped from Cecilia Jeffrey School, he died of exposure and hunger. When Jack was over 60 kilometers from the Cecilia Jeffrey School, and when he was found, his body was bruised from repeated falls. At the inquest into his death, the jury and journalist Ian Adams concluded that when Jack had run away because he was lonely. When Jack's sister believes that he may have run away because he was sexually assaulted. Many students, of course, were sexually and physically abused and assaulted at residential schools. And when Jack's father was not immediately notified that his, his son had died, nor was the family notified of the immediate findings of the inquest. The school made no offer to repatriate when Jack's remains, and only on in the insistence of the family did the authorities reluctantly do so. During this time, the family had only received an earlier letter that said the children were doing well at the school. The Wenjack family only later learned the details of the inquest through CBC radio and newspaper reports. They were not permitted to attend the inquest. Gord Downey famously spent his final days honoring the memory of Charlie Wenjack, establishing the Downey Wenjack Foundation, an organization which provides access to education on the true history of Indigenous people in Canada and the history and legacy of residential schools and encourages reconciliation by way of programming and events. And the Downey Wenjack Foundation is offering one such event this Wednesday. As we think about our engagement and commitment to reconciliation, I would encourage you to participate in that event. In their advertising for the event, They've said the following, and some in attendance or online may have heard this as well. It didn't happen far away. It didn't happen a long time ago. It happened here, and it happened in our lifetime.
According to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's 2015 final report, Canada's Indian residential schools began their operation during the early 1880s, following the passing of the first Indian Act of 1876. At their peak, 90 schools were in operation, but put together over the years, there were about 120 total schools. During their decades of operation, approximately 150,000 Indigenous children were enrolled. TRC recorded approximately 3,200 fatalities at the school, although we may never know the total amount, which is unquestionably higher, some estimates placing it as high as 6,000. The schools, operated by the Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist, and later United Churches, were rife with verbal, physical, and sexual abuse and assault. Malnutrition and disease were rampant. The mortality rate for Indigenous students was five times greater than was the rate among the general population of the students' peer group. For the children, life in these schools was lonely and alien. In addition to exercising harsh discipline, missionaries and teachers suppressed Indigenous cultures and languages, often punishing students who used their own languages or expressed elements of their own culture. This was the very purpose of the schools. The, the eradication, or at least the attempted eradication, of Indigenous cultures and languages and the assimilation of Indigenous youths into the mainstream of Euro-Canadian culture. All of this was done in the name of God. Final report, the final residential school, pardon me, remained open until it was finally closed as recently as 1996. I was 10 years old in 1996. I didn't hear anything about residential schools. And for those that are listening today, much of what I say may be familiar. In fact, I, I think it would be safe to say that those who are in attendance today probably already have an interest in reconciliation. Welcome, Pastor Bruce. Great to have you with us. Thank you. So as you listen today, maybe what I say isn't, isn't new, or maybe these are things that you're already putting into practice. But as I share them with you, I, I hope that this affirms the priority that you may already have exercised. And if nothing else, perhaps give you some talking points as you speak to those who might be reluctant to engage in the process of reconciliation, who might not understand why this is something that everyone in Canada must prioritize. Ray Aldred, who is Cree from Swan, uh, from Swan River Band, Treaty 8 in Alberta, and director of the Indigenous Studies Program at the Vancouver School of Theology, made a chilling observation. And he observed that prior to the residential schooling system, the gospel message had already become indigenized. If we can, if we can do this, if we can just for a moment set aside the abuses the horrors and the crimes that took place within the residential schooling system. As, as followers of Christ, I think one of the greatest grievances is this claim that missionaries practiced at the time that they believed that they were evangelizing indigenous youths through these schools when really, as Dr. Aldred rightly observed, the, the gospel message had already been indigenized. It had already been adopted, taken on by indigenous ministers. Then when the churches sold themselves out and allowed themselves to become the primary instrument of the state to accomplish the work of assimilation, or attempted at least, they allowed the gospel message to become brutalized. That should really trouble us. Just a short month ago, we heard the news of the remains of 215 children at the site of the former residential school on the Kamloops to Sekma territory in Kamloops, BC. There have been others since that time. By June, 4, uh, by, pardon me, by June 14th, another 104 suspected graves of Indigenous children were put forward for further investigation in Brandon, Manitoba. And just last week, news broke of 751 confirmed unmarked graves at the site of a former residential school in Coessis First Nation, Saskatchewan. We're heartbroken by these acts of cruelty and others similar to them. And our thoughts and prayers are with the communities and families of the victims. We also offer up our thoughts and prayers in response to the collective trauma this has triggered for Indigenous people across the country. May God's peace and comfort surround all those affected. As you join me today, rightly we ask the question, what can we do? How, how do we respond to this? What can be done to respond to these findings and to do so in a way that makes a difference? I'm a pastor. So I, I certainly believe that prayers are good, thoughts and prayers are, are good, but they must be accompanied by action. 
much more work remains to be done in the pursuit of truth and reconciliation. In these recent news events that pertain to the injustices and travesties endured by Indigenous people in Canada have brought conversation about reconciliation prominently into the public's attention. And indeed, this is a timely moment for all of us as we prioritize this process. Yet, as we just heard from Dan, for Indigenous people, there's nothing new about these events. The sting of Canada's historic and present colonial policies has been well known since the dawn of Euro-Canadian expansion and settlement across this vast land. For non-Indigenous people, and I speak again as one who is non-Indigenous, it's so important for us, for me, to address these colonial themes still so prevalent within Canada. What I mean by that is this, if reconciliation truly is the goal, then non-Indigenous people must take seriously the pursuit of decolonization seriously to decolonize. Further, before there can be any reconciliation, there needs to be truth and lament. And this is where we come from when we say that reconciliation is not simply an event. It's not just about apologizing once and moving on. As we pursue reconciliation, I truly believe that we've only just begun to hear the truth. We're not even past the truth stage yet. Reconciliation is so much more than an event, and it's something that has to be taken on in the everyday. Looking back and reconciling with the past is a significant part of that. Reconciliation must be an everyday reality, and one that includes the past, the present, and the future. Today we look back so that we can move forward into the future together in healing, reconciliation, and relationship. So again, as, as someone who identifies as non-Indigenous, what that means to me is that sincere apology must be accompanied by everyday actions that demonstrate the desire to change behaviors and to pursue restoration. As Dan established, generally Indigenous people view time differently than Euro-Canadians do, differently than non-Indigenous people do. The idea of forgetting the past is foreign to most Indigenous people. I think here this is something that, again, as, as I speak as someone who is non-Indigenous, I take to heart. Westerners, Euro-Canadians, often will look for this sort of one-and-done solution. Didn't we apologize for that? Did, didn't we talk about that a few years ago? Haven't we dealt with that? It started with the treaties. My ancestors signed the treaties with the Indigenous nations. And the treaties are binding with requirements that remain active today that other Canadians should uphold. I know Indigenous Canadians do. Indigenous people in Canada uphold treaty obligations. Settler Canadians should too. But most in Canada live like the treaties are a document from the past that you to be looked at again. Few people in, in the regions of Canada where treaties apply, few non-Indigenous people even know which treaty covers the territory that they live on. They don't even know the name of it. Here in BC, there are few, if any, treaties. This should trouble us. What this means is that for any of us who are not Indigenous, we're effectively squatters on Indigenous land. We give no right, nor, nor title to the land, which is, it's never been signed over from its original inhabitants. And I think if we're serious about reconciliation, this might sound kind of radical, but we should be interested in changing that situation in BC and making it right. All this time, as Canadians, we've perceived ourselves internationally to be a bastion of human rights and civil liberties. We often view Canada as being moral, morally superior to other countries around the world. We've often compared ourselves to the United States, looking southward at segregation and saying shame on them. All the while, residential schools remained in full force until I was 10 years old. Why did we not also look in the mirror at ourselves and say, shame on us? We tongue-lashed South Africa for its policy of apartheid, saying shame on them. An advanced, developed country must never do such things, and they shouldn't. But all the while, residential schools remained in operation in Canada until the final one closed in 1996. Apartheid was over by then. Why were we not looking in the mirror and saying shame on us? 
Again, we look at the United States and we point to the Wounded Knee Massacre, where hundreds within Sioux Nation were murdered by the United States Army and by their actions in 1890. 1890. Shame on them. And yet, in Canada, not in 1890, in 1990, our governments deployed the Sûreté du Québec, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and ultimately the Canadian Armed Forces against the Kanastatake Mohawk just outside of Oka, Quebec. Tell me one developed country in the world, an advanced economic country in the world, that deploys its armed forces against its own citizens. Happened in our country. Shame on us. Do we realize that for Indigenous people, these are not simply historic facts? These are just events that happened in the past. Until we come to the fa until we come to terms with the fact that in a political system where colonial practices persist, it means this: the past is the present. It's not one and done. It's happening now, and we have a responsibility to respond to it and change it. Only then do we have a chance at reconciliation. Until there is truth, there can be no reconciliation. What it means is this, and, and again, I speak as a non-Indigenous person, don't presume for one minute to speak on behalf of Indigenous people in this country, but I think it's helpful for, for myself and for others who are non-Indigenous to frame it in these terms. It's 2021, but for Indigenous people, every day is wounded knee. Every day is Oka. Every day is Zipper Wash. And every day is Kamloops. This is why reconciliation needs to occur every day. We pursue reconciliation every day, or at least this is what we should do. We no longer can look at it as an apology or an event because it isn't an event. And if we take reconciliation seriously, then it needs to be something taken on every day. Looking back and reconciling with the past is a huge part of that. I'll paraphrase Dr. Terry LeBlanc for a moment. Terry LeBlanc is Mi'kmaq Acadian. He's the founder of My People International, Executive Director of Indigenous Pathways, and founding chair and director of the North American Institute for Indigenous Theological Studies. And again, I'm paraphrasing Dr. LeBlanc as I say this. This is something that he stated. Reconciliation must be an everyday reality and one that includes the past, present, and future. We look back to the beginning, and in this sense, Dr. LeBlanc was actually speaking about the very beginning, creation, God's design for his people. We look back to the beginning so that we can move forward into the future together in reconciliation and relationship. It's important for non-Indigenous people to speak and lean into the reconciliation conversation. We ask Indigenous people again and again to share their story. And when they share their story, I hope we understand, and, and again, speaking as someone who's non-Indigenous, when we ask them to share their story, what we're asking them to do again and again is to recount their trauma. But what do we non-Indigenous people actually do with that? When we hear those stories, what do we actually do with that? We do this at the governmental level all the time with all of the reports. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal People in 1996, the inquiries into Ipperwash in 2007, the inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in 2019, even the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada of 2015. What good are these reports if we don't do something with them? If we don't do something with them, all that we're doing is asking the Indigenous people of this country to again and again recount their trauma, rehearse those events, Relive those events. If we don't respond, if we don't listen and respond, then we're just in a time warp, like Dan said, the cycle of apology, attempts at forgiveness. In the words of Perry Bellegarde, the Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, quote, don't let dust gather on our report. Let's do something. When Indigenous people go through all the hurt and sorrow of recounting their traumas, let's actually do something to make good on our alleged commitment to reconciliation. And, and that's what I hope for all of us to take away from this today. I know I've spoken about some heavy themes, but this is 
serious stuff. Let's actually do something. As we've been hearing about these reports, things coming up in the news, which again, really aren't news, we have a response in terms of how we can respond. We have, we have an option in terms of how we can respond. We have some choices. And, and so maybe that means a social media post, and you know, maybe it means wearing an orange t-shirt on, on orange t-shirt day, and those are great things, and would encourage you to do those things. But I think if we're really serious about this, in addition to doing those things, we'll also take steps, again, to decolonize the colonial structures that persist in our country today. Very practically, that means maybe something as simple as this. There are thousands of First Nations, thousands of, hundreds if not thousands of communities across Canada. Again, Canada, a country which prides itself in being among the top 10 GDP of countries in the world. Hundreds, if not thousands, of communities in this country that for the last decade, several decades, have been under constant boil water advisories. So I'm, I'm in my mid 30s today. I have peers from these communities that are my age and for whom they have not drunk a single drop of water all of their lives that they didn't need to boil first. Just think about that. Think about that on a day when it's 42 degrees in Abbotsford, British Columbia, and we take so for granted being able to turn on the tap and just drink water. Imagine on a, on a day when you're parched with thirst that you might have to boil that water before you drink it. Just things that we take so for granted. That's, that's not happening in a country on the other side of the world. That's happening here, and it's happening now. So as we respond, if we take reconciliation seriously, go on to the Government of Canada website, find out who your MP is, Send them an email, phone them, say, we need to get drinkable water to these communities. We need to do it. We need to make it a priority. It needs to happen now. Listen and respond. Pastor Bruce, just yesterday, our church, Richmond Pentecostal Church, we were so honored to hear your testimony. Uh, we recognized Reconciliation Day as designated by our district and, and really were moved by the words that you shared, the moving, timely, hopeful words that you shared. And what I encouraged my church to do as I encourage everyone here to do is to listen. Really listen. You probably heard the phrase, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I don't know if I'm part of the solution yet, but I do know that by our ignorance, and so long as we remain ignorant, we remain part of the problem. Some in attendance here today, maybe some tuning in online, you, you may recall that at the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada's 2012 General Conference in Ottawa, the Fellowship issued a, a joint statement of apology and reconciliation. It was a powerful moment. You can watch the video online. It really was the culmination of many years of partnership, perhaps at times periodic tension in ministry. And indeed, that's what the leadership of the PAOC apologized for, were some of the attitudes, the behaviors of the past and present, and committed to work together in partnership toward a better future. Recent events have caused many within the PAOC to pause and reflect on the road to reconciliation. There's some discontent, I believe, with the fact that there's perceived to have been little progress to have been made in this area since 2012. And the conversation about reconciliation only really resurfaces when issues affecting Indigenous people are heightened in the media and might otherwise be forgotten or at least overlooked. Sometimes even within our own fellowship, within the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, we might point the finger at leadership and say, this person or that person should be doing more. I want to I want to confront and challenge that response. I don't see it that way. In the first place, our leadership did step up and apologize and, and had this moment of exchange. But more than that, I don't perceive that reconciliation is any one person's responsibility. I think it's everyone's responsibility. And I think instead of being critical, we need to be productive. We need to make good on the words that have been spoken and the assurances made. We're serious about reconciliation. It's something that each and every one of us, especially we non-Indigenous folks, advertise and make good on every day. 
mentioned Ray Aldred to you moments ago. In response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report, Ray Aldred gave these points as instructions to Canadian evangelicals wishing to realize the objectives of reconciliation. First of all, he said this, with contrite hearts, we acknowledge the sin of residential schools and learn the truth about them. Secondly, we develop a theology of suffering that begins with listening to those who have been wronged and violated. Listening. Thirdly, we develop a shared plan for reconciliation or restoration. And restoration, pardon me. As I mentioned previously, there cannot be reconciliation until there is truth and lament. And really, I believe we're only just beginning to hear the truth. As we do hear the truth, let's listen. It didn't happen far away. It didn't happen a long time ago. It happened right here, and it happened in our lifetimes. 150,000 or more Indigenous children accosted for the simple act of observing and living out their cultures, customs, languages, and spiritualities. For over 4,000 of them, it cost them their lives. It stripped them of their lives. As we hear these facts, it could be easy, easy for us to, to be paralyzed and not know what we can do. But we don't need to feel as though there's nothing that we can do. In the very first place, and at the very minimum, we can listen. Finally, listen. Are you listening? The scripture says, may those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aaron Ross, for, for this paper and presentation. And now we immediately, immediately call up uh, Pastor uh, Bruce Brown to come and reflect and uh, tell your story and what you have to tell, what you have to say tonight. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Ross. Really good presentation. And uh, you're mentioning all these guys, and I've been with them for years in uh, Pentecostal Assemblies in Canada, leadership working alongside uh, trying, to, uh, trying to develop all of these years a, a workable solution for the Pentecostal Assemblies to go into the native reservations and minister the gospel of Christ. And, uh, um, we're disappointed, you know, in, uh, in the results uh, that we've had through the years. Uh, I've been uh, in leadership uh, with the Pentecostal Assemblies for um, possibly uh, 45 years anyway in leadership, and um, um, uh, I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my my journey anyway with the PAOC, and maybe another 15 years or so. <laughs> and uh, but uh, um, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, really hoping, you know, that uh, something can be done um, uh, for. Um, um, a real ministry in our native villages and uh, really reaching into the into the villages and ministering the gospel and and uh, doing it in such a way that it would be uh, really acceptable you know and uh, and children would look forward to it on a daily basis and uh, that would be really nice if we could have that uh, developed on a on a regular basis in all of our denominations um, um, uh, as you indicate, I'm um, uh, Pastor Bruce Brown of the Pentecostal uh, Assemblies of Canada for Vancouver Native Pentecostal Church. And uh, I've been ministering over 50 years uh, now, and uh, I got saved in 1969. And uh, I went to two Indian residential schools. I went uh, to Alert Bay. Uh, when I was seven years old, they picked me up, and uh, RCMP came and got me. And uh, my dad, uh, uh, he also went to Indian residential school, and he had some uh, he had some uh, 
issues, you know, <laughs> with it. And uh, lots of drunkenness and, uh, in the house and uh, lots of partying and fighting and blood and stuff like that uh, as I grew up as a, as a young boy. Um, but I loved my parents so much, you know, and they were hardworking. But when I came to the alcohol, it was devastating. And uh, so uh, that was uh, uh, the life of a child. But when I when I went into uh, when they took us, they, they they took us on a freighter, and they put us down in the hold. Uh, it was about 40, 40 of us or so, uh, all of us in one big hold down below. Uh, we didn't have anything at all, hardly any lighting, and uh, everybody was picked up without any notification. Uh, the RCMP and the Indian agent went uh, with the list from house to house and took us out. My dad tried to object, but the RCMP was there as well, and uh, he did unbuckle his uh, uh, his holster. In those days, when an RCMP unbuckled unbuckled their holster, it was uh, to shoot, and uh, so dad had to back off. And I was standing there. Uh, crying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. You know, and uh, and uh, uh, but uh, but uh, but I I had to go anyway. And so, uh, as amongst all about forty of us, and we went over to Alert Bay. We stayed in the hold all the way uh, to Alert Bay. Uh, there were some uh, there were some cabins up above, and uh, and uh, people uh, rented them. Uh, but we were not allowed to go up uh, up into the upper deck. We had to stay down in the hold, and so they brought food to us. And uh, our, uh, all we heard was crying all the way. Uh, kids crying, missing their moms and dads, why they had to be taken away. And so uh, it was a very fearful trip, <laughs> and uh, not knowing what we would get. So we got there, and, uh, and uh, we registered. And uh, we, uh, everyone registered. We have to take off all our clothes and and get into their clothes, and uh, and uh, we had to have all our heads shaved right away, nice put up on us to make sure uh, that we were our heads were clean. And so uh, um, that was our introduction to uh, Indian residential school in Earth Bay, and. Uh, yeah, it wasn't very good. I was always hungry. That's all I remember being hungry all the time. Uh, I was so hungry. I was doing the. I was doing the. I was doing the. Uh, uh, the garbage detail, and uh, that was given to the bad boys, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, who didn't obey and stuff like that. And so that's what I got that one weekend, and and uh, I did the garbage. And I found in there, I don't know if you ever remember those uh, those um, squirrel peanut butter cans that they used to have before. Uh, um, it, I haven't seen them for years, but uh, that was my favorite squirrel peanut butter. When Dad brought it out, man, I was happy about that. And uh, But uh, I found that one in the garbage can. It was unopened, and oh, I was so happy. And uh, so... Uh, I hid it away, and uh, after the day school was over, we came back to the Indian Residential School, and I went up, took the can, and I uh, hid it away up in the bushes, took a hole, marked it, and uh, that was my that was my uh, that was my dinner. <laughs> and I opened it up. I got it open, and you know how it's brown inside? Well, it was green right through. And I ate the whole thing, you know, and that's how hungry I was. And uh, uh, so uh, that kind of gives you a, just a little idea of some of the things we went through as children. And uh, um, maybe from eating that, uh, that green uh, peanut butter, uh, I contacted TB2 as well. So uh, I cried at nights and, uh, because uh, it hurt so bad in my lungs. And starting to spit some blood a little bit once in a while, and the pain was so, especially at night, uh, unbearable. And I would cry. I put the pillow over my head, and uh, try uh, try not to uh, keep, uh, keep people up. But it did. And then the uh, supervisor would come in, 
and turn on the lights. Anybody was sleeping, they woke us up, undressed me, and then uh, in front of everybody, they beat me uh, on the back and the front, uh, laid over on the front, and they whipped me and beat me like that. I don't know how many times I got beat because I had TB. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't keep quiet, uh, crying and whimpering. And uh, so it wasn't a very good time there. Um, uh, you know, there's just a just a little little touch about about some of the things that happened in there. And uh, uh, there's so much, you know, apology going on. And what are we going to do now with this? Uh, uh, with this Kamloops 215, I call it, and uh, 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 the, the um, Saskatchewan, uh, the revelation about that one too as well. And uh, we're just starting into um, into a really uh, a dark area, I think, of uh, of our Indian residential school process, you know, with the, at least with the Roman Catholic Church anyway. And uh, so uh, they're going to have a hard time. Uh, already, uh, four churches mysteriously burnt down in that area, and so uh, uh, it's not a good feeling at all, you know. It's, and uh, it makes me wonder, as a as a Pentecostal pastor, um, uh, all my life I've been in native ministry, reaching out to my own native people, up and down the coast, all around Canada, down into the United States. And then uh, if there was any Indians running around over in Africa and, uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine and Germany and those other places like that, well, I went there anyway and priest. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a great time in that area. But um, out of all of it, I think that, uh, you know, I, um, I remember uh, I, I didn't like the idea of being called a survivor. Um, because uh, um, I went in, uh, I went in, uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, I did well in, in, uh, in school after, after I really got serious about it. And up until that time, I was in high school as a real failure all the way through, drunk, drunk when I was uh, 13 and stuff like that. And, uh, but, uh, uh, once I uh, once I ended up getting saved in 1969, uh, everything changed and reversed. And, and both my wife and I, uh, I used to beat my wife, uh, you know, and stuff like that, treat her mean, and, and uh, tell her I loved her. When I got drunk, it was a different matter, you know, in that area. And so out of control, and uh, 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 she used to say. You know, uh, Bruce, I don't know if I love you anymore, <laughs> you know. And I, and I used to say, I don't blame you, I hate myself, you know. And, and so uh, uh, it was really difficult. Um, but, but when we got saved, we started to heal. And uh, the healing process took place. It wasn't too long, I became a pilot. I did, um, I did training out of, uh, out of Langley here. Yeah. And... Uh, a long time ago, and, and graduated uh, with really good, uh, with a good recommendation for Air Canada. Uh, they came and interviewed me, and, and they wanted me to uh, join them over in Ontario. And uh, my my little Haida Indian lady, uh, she said, "No way, <laughs> I'm not going there." <laughs> so I took a job in Prince Rupert and uh, became a uh, I became a uh, uh, a bus pilot and just loved it. It was great. I flew for about 21 years there as a bus pilot, and uh, and then after that I went and upgraded myself to airline transport rating. And as soon as I did that, everything opened up for me. They hired me. They put me on uh, on uh, a larger aircraft, and I was a captain right off the bat. And uh, went right through. I went with WestJet, flew them uh, with them, and uh, became their uh, captain on them. And uh, um, it was a really good life. That part of it, you know. But uh, all the time, there was all this, uh, this, this, this darkness that was always there. All the harm that was done. Why we had to go through it. Trying to reason uh, within myself. How how could I walk into into uh, this Canadian world, uh, and yet be able to 
uh, keep uh, keep my contact and proper communication with my own people, you know, in that area. And uh, um, I thought we did pretty good anyway, Adeline and I. Uh, my wife, she's Haida, and uh, she has uh, three uh, uh, three degrees and plus a master's degree in art therapy. Uh, she still works. She's 75 years old. She still works yet. And uh, she works with the Indian Residential School Society. Uh, they are super busy now. She hasn't had a day off for about uh, uh, well, over a month now. She's been so busy. And, uh, and uh, she does an awesome job in that area. Um, she tried to she tried to quit uh, uh, resign, uh, but they wouldn't let her. They gave her a, they gave her a ten thousand uh, dollar uh, promotion. <laughs> yeah, they just bought you off. <laughs> and uh, she was uh, she was uh, did really well. And she just loves her job, you know, does excellent job. And her uh, counseling skills are amazing, you know, and just uh, so many Native people have been healed. Uh, other nations, they come to her and, and uh, she just, uh, they're working with some people on Zoom uh, over different parts of the country. And uh, it's just amazing things are done on that, uh, that type of counseling. But anyway, uh, just to let you know that uh, that's the kind of things that we had to grow up with. Um, and that was uh, that was uh, as a little boy. Um, I also went to day schools. Um, I went to. Um, uh, I was in the. Uh, I was in the uh, welfare folks. I was in the welfare system, and. Uh, I'm always really fiddling and stuff like that too, you know. Uh, amazing, I was an airplane pilot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, we went to Indian, Indian residential schools, uh, day schools. Uh, with the, uh, uh, and then, uh, and then, of course, we have the '60s school that goes out where they took where they took the natives and they sent them to different parts of the world. And uh, so. Uh, uh, like uh, a lot of the stories, even our, our our great beautiful queen, you know, uh, almost 100 years old, and what a lady she is, you know, honored her all my life and stuff, and just uh, felt uh, a part of England, you know, in that area, and because we had an English teacher that came over direct from England and came to our day school, and uh, we learned the bonnie and the boot instead of uh, other things. You know. <laughs> And so it was a different experience, but uh, uh, you know these the, all you, you put all these things together, and uh, how are we going to reconcile? Mm -hmm. This is this is this is the uh, this is the crunch right now. I've been trying it for uh, fifty years, you know, and uh, I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, I love my brothers and sisters. I love. I'm so proud to be with the Pentecostal. Assemblies of Canada. Uh, if I could get a badge, I'd wear it. You know, P A O C. But uh, and and uh, I've, I've been on the DLT district leadership team, and uh, and uh, sitting with the big boys, you know, and stuff like that. And and uh, I've uh, I've been on leadership uh, all across Canada for years and years and years in that area. And uh, but we haven't found the solution. We haven't found the solution yet, and um, um, we have our ideas, but uh, we're having a hard time getting our ideas uh, to uh, actually flourish and see if it will really, really produce any kind of a flower, you know, and and uh, and, uh, and become fruitful in those areas. And so, um, I would do, I would really love it if we were able to get. Uh, a little bit more uh, openness uh, to our suggestions and how we could do things uh, in our villages and uh, reach out to the people. There are so many areas that uh, that uh, that we have to deal with uh, because of the uh, the government uh, um, uh, that has um, overpowered us all all of our lives, and, uh, and ever since we made the treaties. 
They made the treaties, you know, uh, they dictated them. And uh, so, um, uh, and like good little boys, uh, we pretty well obeyed them pretty good, you know. They took away our language, uh, we kept quiet. They took away our clothes. Uh, my dad hid all his regalia and everything up in the attic. And, uh, and, uh, and once in a while he'd go up and, and uh, sit there up in the attic, you know, looking at them and, uh, and missing that part of his culture that, uh, that, uh, that he knew. And, uh, and he wouldn't allow us to speak our, our language uh, for our protection because uh, they were uh, severely beat. Uh, and even put it into jail because they spoke uh, the language. And uh, where they were at, that, at that time they went, they were only allowed to, uh, four or five people in a group. If there was any more than that, then they were uh, chased away or one was taken off to jail for the night type thing. So there was a lot of pressure on us in those areas. Uh, but I, I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of people hurting right now. Uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, that will be, uh, there will be a lot more revelation concerning uh, all that was there. My wife, she used to say, uh, Bruce, she said, uh, I've gone way over uh, two or three hundred, uh, two hundred and fifty or something like that. Um, um, Native uh, people who have uh, uh, given their uh, testimony and uh, regarding uh, their life on Indian residential schools. And she sat with them and counseled them and helped them through uh, the lawyers and the judges and stuff like that. And, and uh, then, uh, then one day uh, she set me up and uh, helped me through it too. <laughs> and she was smart. And uh, I didn't want to go at all, but uh, somehow she got me into there. And uh, so I went through that and, uh, uh, and she said, Bruce, she said, so many people have uh, come out and made these statements. It's written down, it's recorded, uh, that uh, so many were killed and buried. And uh, a lot of the Native uh, children had to bury the ones who had died. And, uh, and uh, they were sworn to be quiet in that area. And, and still today, uh, they'll, they'll only talk to people that they can trust in that area. And so, uh, you know, we're still way back in the past yet. Uh, we're stuck there. And uh, uh, we can't, can't seem to find our way uh, out of that maze, you know. And so for me, um, uh, all, everything on the outside, it, it looks really successful. I've done a lot of things. I was elected chief of my village. I was involved in politics. I could have gone a long way, but uh, I heard uh, God calling me to the ministry rather than to political. And thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jesus, for that. You know, and so uh, uh, um, uh, uh, this reconciliation. Uh, I'm still number one. I'm interested. And how can I reach uh, any person with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And, uh, and uh, um, whether they're, they're white or they're, they're, they're black people or whether they're our own native people, how do I reach them? How am I going to be effective? And am I, am I, uh, am I a pastor who is uh, qualified enough to be able to be a leader? and uh, say, do this, and when I say do this, it is, nothing is done, you know, in that area. So why am I saying do this? Uh, it, I think it'll work, you know, and, uh, but uh, it hasn't been tried, you know, in that area. And so uh, these are the things that, that, that affect me and uh, as a minister in the, of the gospel of Christ. And I know it affects every pastor. Uh, it's a challenge to everyone. All the different native, uh, all the different um, uh, uh, people uh, from all the different worlds and all the nationalities are coming into Canada. How do we deal with them? And they all go to their own people 
uh, they're all segregated, little pots of them all over Canada, you know, and they have all these little flowers that are growing, new flowers all over the place. And then we have the Indian flower, you know, and so uh, it's still a problem, you know, uh, uh, to, the na to the Canadian people. It's a problem. And, uh, and it uh, has been said to me many times in that area. And uh, I'm really good at letting everything go by, but I let some drop in too as well. And uh, so um, um, there's a lot to be said, um, but uh, uh, I'm bearing the past, uh, but I'm wanting to uh, see the future. I want to see the future of Christ fulfilled in reaching out to the gospel uh, 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 to our native people and to see them actually uh, really being saved, you know, in that area, coming to that place, rising up as leaders. One of the things that I have this last 50 years as a native pastor is uh, I have risen up into some of those areas that many others were not allowed to. And um, um, I have some really bad stories to tell you, but I don't want to say it anyway. And uh, I don't think I have really ever said some of them. Uh, things that happened to me as a native pastor that shouldn't have happened. And, uh, and uh, from uh, my brothers and sisters, you know, in that area. And so um, um, I want to see that corrected. I want to see that uh, where we can really have uh, honest fellowship and, and uh, together in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, and build that amongst uh, our Canadian people and be able to see that arise. And that's what's in my heart, you know. Uh, I know a lot about the political part of it, uh, the things that that uh, have been done in the past and, and all of those things. We talk about it all the time. Uh, uh, we go through it, and uh, it's almost memory for all of us now. Uh, and uh, all the dates and everything else uh, and things that were done. Uh, but uh, I'm looking... And I'm hoping that the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, the other denominations, will start to open up. I mean, open up and uh, and uh, and allow uh, Native ministry to flourish. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be afraid of Native ministry. It's there. It, it, it's part of God's uh, uh, God's plan. <laughs> Thank God for that. That's what I can tell myself. It's God's plan, you know, and, uh, to be able to come into that. Uh, so uh, reconciliation then uh, is, of course, First uh, Corinthians 5. Eh? It tells us that we are reconciled to God first in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. And then the reconciliation, we have to go out and bring reconciliation of Christ to others. And uh, we haven't uh, been all that good at it when it came to Native ministries in that area. And, uh, and uh, a lot of it has been our fault, too, uh, and uh, because of the way uh, we were brought up and, uh, and the things that were imposed upon us through, through all these years. You know, you don't do this. You can't do that. Don't talk, you know. Uh, be quiet, and, uh, and uh, you're just a problem. You know, um, yeah, they always tell me that, you know, and that type of thing. And so uh, we need to open ourselves up in that area. And and, uh, and I think and I believe with all that's happening now that the church should be the ones that were leading the way into uh, opening everything up, confessing. Uh, uh, humbling ourselves before uh, the native people. You know, what can we do? Go and humble yourself and uh, speak to them. Uh, put yourself forward there. What can I do to help? They'll, they'll tell you, oh, just come and, come and drum with us. Uh, oh, 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 you know. <laughs> and so uh, go and learn how, you know, and do that. And, uh, and uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, how many uh, sisters and uh, brothers you have adopted in your life so quickly? They just love. Uh, uh, they just love that. And uh, I, 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 I'm, I know I'm rambling, you know. And uh, uh, because uh, after I after this, I went to an Indian resident residential school in Edmonton, 
And that's where my wife went to as well. She went to an Indian residential school, same place as I did. And uh, she got A's and I got D's, you know, and so uh, she was very smart. And uh, um, uh, she had a better experience than I did. But, you know, uh, compared to all that she's listened to all these years uh, as a counselor and helping uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the legal parts of uh, the exposure uh, of Indian residential school to the law, um, um, uh, she, uh, there's some things that's happened in her life that she saw and that were done to her that she doesn't think it's very bad. But yet, if someone else were to look at it from that uh, point of view, they would say, how could they do something like that with you or against you compared to the things that were done to the other people? She's so humble in that area about it, you know. And so there's many of us like that that, that think we haven't really been uh, uh, been battered about it at all. But in actual fact, uh, even our my own children, they, um, uh, the, the psychologists and professionals are the ones who tell us that uh, these kids are uh, displaying the same kind of problems uh, that the Indian residential school uh, people had, exactly the same, just as bad. The numbers are just as high. And uh, so it spreads and it goes out and it, uh, and it goes on. And so it's gonna be a while it's going to be a lot of things, but I say this. Um, we all knew what was going on in Indian residential schools, but this is just a shock to our Canadian people mm -hmm. and an exposure of all that was going on unlawfully uh, in our own country and when it shouldn't have been, you know, and uh, under the guise of Christ. That's the thing that hurts so much. You know, how could they say that about the Jesus who died on the cross for me and uh, and uh, all that I went through, he forgave me, you know, all that I had to do, he helped me heal in those areas. And uh, so um, uh, 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 this reconciliation, um, um, thanks for saying it's a big thing. And it is, it's, it's a monstrous area and it has to be, uh, the present situation has to be reconciled. <laughs> Our reconciling has to be redone. <laughs> uh, it's 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 just not working. It's not effective. And so, is that what Christ meant? I don't think so. You know, I don't think so. And so, we need to work together and uh, and bring something uh, that'll produce Christ likeness in us. Thank you. Uh, I hope I, I haven't uh, gone off the track here. I'm trying to be gentle about it. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So when I was listening, Aaron and also, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not a pilot, though. Uh, when I was listening, Aaron and Bruce, uh, a couple of things came to my mind. I was hearing a few things. Reconciliation is a big thing, and it is a one day at a time and one person at a time. And of course, that is wrapped to, to uh, reconciliation that we have experienced in, in Christ. We have the message of reconciliation to this world, right? Including 